Have you ever wondered how your sales performance compares against your competitors and peers? The B2B Sales Benchmark Report provides the definitive guide to what success looks like in 2021. See how you compare in terms of win rate, sales cycle, average deal value, relationships, and engagement. You can see the results and get the full report at ebster.com forward slash B2B dash sales dash benchmarks. This is Sales Ops Demystified, the number one most downloaded podcast in sales operations. We invite the brightest minds in sales operations onto the show to deconstruct the why, what, and how behind rep productivity, forecasting, metrics, and all things revenue. This podcast is brought to you by Ebster, the leading customer engagement platform for Salesforce. Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today, we're joined by Patrick Hogan, who just said to me, he's been in the IT world for approximately 40 years. He wrote his first line of code in 1979, but has also, more importantly, been in sales for 37 years. Now is currently the director of sales ops at Multivista. Patrick, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Tom. Pleased to be here. I'm a big fan of the show. Thank you so much. That makes me feel really good. Um, first question then, I understand you have a significant amount of sales experience. And I think it might have just been the last role where you transitioned into sales ops. I'd like to understand why you did that. Um, you know, after being in sales for 35 years, so one of the things I've enjoyed most, uh, particularly as a sales manager, was training people, seeing young people succeed. I, I have three kids myself that are all do well. So uh, to me, this has been the first role I've taken where I have a chance to do what I love most, which is uh, enabling salespeople, training them, and making sure they got the right tools. So to me, it's a, it's a dream job. Got it. And so a big part of what you're focused on at Multivista is enablement and ensuring these reps have all the skills and the tools they need to be productive. Correct. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So if we just focus a little bit more on Multivista, how, approximately how many reps are you kind of responsible for? And then how many people are there in your ops team? Mm -hmm. Uh, I've got six people in my ops team. Um, we, we have a bit of a unique model in that multi-Vista is primarily have uh, franchises. So we've got about 80 franchises around the world. And this is another thing I love about them. In my, in my heart, I'm a small business person. And, and these franchises are small business people. So we have about about 120 sort of customer facing people, I'll say, because in some cases, our larger franchises have full sales staff and sales managers. Some of our smaller and newer franchises are, it's almost owner operator, if you will, you know, they'll have smaller staff. So the, the variety is quite a bit uh, uh, pronounced. Good. And then so over those 80 or 30 franchises, how many kind of salespeople are you guys responsible for helping? Uh, over 100, probably about 110 now. Got it. So eight <clears throat> to 100. Amazing. Um, and what is the tech stack that you're currently working with to, or, or like, how do you give the, is the sales tech stack centralized with the main company and then you give access to the franchisees or do each franchisee have their own stack? No, we, we have, a, we have a system that is part of what we sell as a franchise is, is our systems. Uh, we have Salesforce is our stack. It's pretty central to what we do. We've, we've had it for 10 years now. Um, we're using HubSpot for our marketing. And uh, more recently, uh, analytics, uh, we're looking at Amplitude. We, we've been, our, our product people have done a great job of instrumenting our product. So now we have analytics with, uh, with Amplitude. So we're, we're excited about how to put that to work as well. Awesome. So you're, when a franchisee buys in, they're getting not only the, like, the textbook for how to run the business, they're also getting a playbook, I guess, for sales that includes support <laughs> from you guys. Very much so. We have an excellent resource called Multivista University. 
uh, which has been developed over the last five or six years and, and is amazing. It's it's all aspects because again, we, we're investing in our franchisees. There's all aspects of running the business, uh, certainly on the sales side, but also on the operational side, how to train our photographers. I guess we should mention, we do, we do construction photography uh, documentation. So part of our business is our, our photographers going on site and documenting construction projects. Cool. So we have Multivista University, which is an excellent uh, learning tool. Awesome. Now, so a few guests have said, in sales ops, your customers are actually the salespeople. But here, that's almost a little bit more true, right? Because your salespeople are like they're franchisees, but they, they are assume they, they paid to buy the franchise. So they are actually also customers. Very much so. Yeah, great customers, and, and uh, we have to take good care of them. They're, they're, sure. I was thinking about earlier, what I liked about our entrepreneur is they're very entrepreneurial. In my career, I've kind of gone back and forth working for big companies like Hewlett Packard or Oracle, and then I go to a small company and take everything I learned from the big company and make it work for the small company. So I've done that four or five times in my career. So I have a soft spot for, for small business people, and that's what our, really what our franchises are. They're my customers. Awesome. So can you share something that, your team has done that has like significantly improved the productivity of the franchisee sales people. Um, you know, we, we started with first principles and we thought, okay, this COVID, COVID has been a good example of that as, as we're right in the middle of that right now or coming, coming to the middle of it. Um, COVID has been a great example where all of a sudden in our business uh, construction sites were being shut down totally. So uh, what we what operations took on was we thought these are all great entrepreneurs and very smart uh, owners out there. Uh, we took it upon ourselves to gather intel from them, what they were doing to mitigate, what their clients were doing, and then quickly turned around and shared that back out to our, uh, our, our salespeople. So we took best practices and COVID uh, risk mitigation, and we, we made our salesperson be relevant to their clients at a time when really clients weren't interested in buying, but they were interested in knowing what was going on. So something that uh, we found has been really effective for us recently is as our sharing this caring campaign. We tell salespeople, don't call to sell something, call to, to share something. Here's some best practices that other construction firms are using. And at the same time, gather, what are you doing to mitigate that we can kind of share with our colleagues? So that's, that's had a good effect recently. It's, it's kept salespeople busy at a time when really not a lot of people are moving forward with projects, but they're building connections. We like to think that, uh, that are trusted advisory connections that when we come out of the other end of this thing, it'll, it'll, uh, they'll be well-placed to, to have these relationships. Does that make sense? Yeah. So but just to dig into that a little bit more. So you as a central sales ops team have gone to all of the franchisee salespeople and said, look, this is something that we think you guys should do. Mm -hmm. you want to do it like are you prescriptive do you say that you guys need to do this thing uh, we don't have to tell them they need to do it uh, we find that uh, we say here's what here's how it's working for others it's always been a good thing if somebody's taken we're happy to steal a good idea um you know too so you know, what we said to them is here's what's working in other markets we, we've had a bit of an advantage tom in that we're around the world we were able to see for example the uk shut down so we've got some very successful franchises in the UK. So they were able to describe us what it looked like just before all these sites, sites uh, shut down. So we were able to take those in, at intelligence and go to other uh, geo geographies and said, you know, get ready. If you're going to shut down, these are the things that are happening. You can you can get ready. You can share these with your clients. You can be Johnny on the spot with with a solution. Uh, to so we were able to use our global uh, uh, intelligence to help uh, other franchises help each other. Prepare. And now we're in a stage where a lot of these uh, sites now are getting ready to come back up again. So, uh, you know, and again, the UK's led it. They've, they've, they've talked about here's some markets that are exploding for us in, under a restart scenario. So, with so much uncertainty of COVID, we were able to kind of gather quickly uh, insights, educational insights, and turn around and put them back out to the field. So, we've made our salespeople, you know, relevant, which is important. I totally see the value there. You're, you're lifting insights from other places in the world that may be at different stages and then taking that directly to your yeah. well via your salespeople to their clients um and then the other point was about kind of the reason for that and i think you mentioned at the end about being the trusted advisor so that you're still there adding value to them and their lives so that when we do come out of this you in theory you'll be the first people they talk to is that accurate that's very accurate yeah and and, and it's true the other thing is to help take that global perspective and bring it back to the local sales rep you know, because sometimes they'd be a little nervous about what's going on. And we're able to sort of not only say that, you know, multi-vista, because we enable remote workers, which is the new paradigm in construction, people don't want to go, aren't able to travel to construction sites. Uh, you know, if we, if we play our cards right and we're educational, we're actually going, we can actually come out of this stronger than we were. It's a market opportunity for us to help keep people safe. 
you know, you think about people don't want to don't want to travel. So when you know, always there's that higher purpose. We say is we help our clients keep their people safe by letting them work from home. Um, there's another neat story where one of our clients is at NASA, and NASA to their to their um, to their credit, uh, they had a project that was being shut down, 64,000 square foot project. And they wanted us to come up and, and document the site exactly as it was when they shut down so they could turn around and pay. They could prove progress and pay all their little sub-trades who could in turn feed their families too. So stories like that are, are important to share at this time as to you know why we're doing what we're doing. So we've been able to do that is go and gather these stories, turn around, package them up a little bit, and then and then push push them back out. And again, it gives the salesperson something to talk about when they when they are reaching out to these new or existing clients and say, hey, just just looking to share some good ideas that are happening out in the field that may help you mitigate. And we actually task them with at the end of that, say, hey, can I ask you what you're doing? In case you're doing something kind of cool, we want to share that back to your colleagues. So you're almost like information brokers. Well, yeah, pretty much so. And that's what we said. Treat it like a research call, not a selling call. You know, do a little research and, and there's some great, great uh, yeah, great things coming out that, that are sometimes insights that aren't related to what we sell, but again, it would, would uh, help a salesperson stand out in a prospect's mind because the salesperson shared something. For sure. And I'm from a marketing background. I would also love to take all of those insights and then you could publish them. I, I'm not saying that you guys would do yeah. that, but that's also an added. Oh, you've done it. Great. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. One of our first pieces that went out when COVID really took off was five ways we can help. You know, we didn't say one at a time. We actually said, here's five ways you can use what you know what you have. Uh, one of the really examples is with our product, it's a feature, I'm not, not selling it, it's, is we have unlimited users. So people didn't realize that. So we said, you know what, if you have all your documentation right now and your bank wants to send you a check if you can prove progress, you have unlimited users, send them a, send them a login. You know, and, and, and now they can look at the, the, the visuals themselves. Our site's very easy to use. Things like that, they're kind of going, well, that's kind of cool, you know, because my banker can't come from, from Oklahoma, so we, you know, you can look at it. So we think that's part of the new paradigm coming out is remote workers have to be able to see visuals to, to prove progress. Is there anything else you've done to help the, the salespeople and the franchises like manage this time or be more productive? Any tools that you've started or stopped using? Uh, as much tools as training, we focused on a couple of things uh, quite quickly. One was uh, um, uh, uh, how to call someone and and do a bit of a sales triage. Just we we reiterated our training and cold calling, if you will, and you know training and reaching out. Um, the other thing we're working on is uh, is doing demos uh, on Zoom or over online demos. Now we used to do an awful lot of probably over half our demos face to face, but a new reality now is is doing this. And we had a lot of our reps were not familiar with how to how to run or the agenda of an online uh, uh, presentation like this. So we, uh, we, we've, we've updated our training and we've added in how to set up the call, how to, how to make sure the dog's not in the, on the, on the living room when you're having your calls. <laughs> so really helping salespeople to be more comfortable um, selling um, uh, over, the, over, uh, uh, over online like this. You know, to have all the, a lot of the little things you have to do to, to have a good conference call to prepare for it. Cool. Have you had to change or tweak any of the forecasts for this year or next year based on the kind of recent times? Uh, um, we, were, we, were, we were worried about that, but no, actually we've, we're, we're coming through pretty good. We're finding some projects obviously were put on hold, but uh, as we mentioned, by, by sharing cool insights and new use cases from other markets, we've actually managed to hold pretty steady on, on, the, on the revenue line. Or two, so we're, we're, in good, we're in good shape. Uh, other new opportunities have opened up to replace the ones, conventional ones that were shut down. And the good news is, I don't think these new opportunities are going to go away. You know, it's a, it should be incremental for us. So we're we're feeling good. Fantastic. Now, the 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 normal sales forecasting process. Who? How does that work with the franchisees? Are you responsible for bringing up all of the forecasts for each individual fran franchisee, or what happens? Uh, uh, it, it's uh, franchisees is what you'd expect a little bit with a, with a bunch of kind of entrepreneurial people. We've got some great users of it, and some other people are just fairly fundamental. Uh, it's something we're we're, um, we're working on, and again, we're, we're coming out of the point of saying a lot of our, our sales managers are also owners, are also photographers. Uh, we're, we're working towards simplifying our sales process, and a lot of the stuff I've picked up listening to your podcast and, and your conversation with Kim, we've put into practice to to really say what is you know what's the simplest way somebody can be a good sales manager in maybe half an hour a day, 
or maybe even two hours a week. You know, what's what does a conversation look like? A lot of the the, the the owners are not salespeople; they're not they're photographers or they're construction people. So we say, here's how to have a a, a guided conversation with your salespeople. And, and again, a lot of it came from you know what I stole from, uh, from uh, sales ops demystified. What's the old saying? If you steal one idea, it's plagiarism. If you steal five, you're a consultant. So I've got a lot of good ideas from there, um, from you guys. So we, we've worked on making our forecast very simple. Um, uh, something that I think Kim may have mentioned in one of your previous podcasts that, that we, we used back when I was at Hewlett Packard, we had uh, Siebel at the time as a CRM. And uh, it was, it was, as a matter of fact, it became a verb. An application got civilized when it had 10 screens with 50 fields on each screen. Nobody knew how to use it for forecasting. But what they did was, I thought it was beautiful. They had one radio button called commit. And I think you know where I'm going with this. It's a beautiful thing. You know, it's, it, it kind of leaps over all the stages and probabilities. And if the person, salesperson felt that deal was coming in at any stage, he hit commit. And we were pretty much counting on the deal when he hit commit. So for a, a new sales manager, you say the first thing you look at is your, your commits, and then you look at the, uh, your pull-ins. What can you pull into the quarter? So it can be a ten to fifteen-minute kind of conversation, you know, for a non-sales manager with with a salesperson. If you can wrap it around good intel from CRM like these commits and, and pull-ins. So we're working towards uh, being so good at what we do and providing such good information that we get better adoption. Our adoption is pretty good right now of our forecasting and CRM, but we think we can get even closer to, to 100% by making it worth their while. You know, they actually use the tools. And again, that, that all starts with making sure the salesperson is using the tools and sees the value in it, right? So long-winded answer. Um, yeah. The, the idea, though, is if you have your commits and you have your pull-ins, you're going to have pretty good forecasting, better than most. Got it. And so the what what is quite interesting here is that it's like you're managing 80 sales managers, but the sales managers can only work one day a week. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Got it. Yeah. And, and they got their styles, you know, and then, uh, like I said, I can't stress enough that a lot of them are brilliant. They're, they're smart business people have been in business a long time. Uh, they've worked out their own systems, which is nice. Some of our some of our best franchises are on our advisory committees. They're doing some really cool stuff. So I'm about seven, eight months into the role. So I've surrounded myself with, with people I think are, are like-minded in that they, they see the value of intelligence and, and, and helps them run their business. But that's, that's what I encourage my team. Anything we do, I'm always saying, think of the sales rep who's sitting in front of his computer and a phone. You know, what, what's it going to do to make him more effective or her more effective? And then after that, think about the sales manager. That's our, that's our constituent. Yeah. yeah. On metrics, now, being in sales for a few years, I assume you've you've come across your fair share of sales metrics. If you could only measure one for the rest of your career, which would you choose? Uh, you know, I love commits. I think commits are kind of good. You know, I, I used to say to my salespeople, if you're above quota, it's a beautiful life. Uh, just keep your commits up. And, you know, anything you need, you let me know. If you're below quota, then we'll work on that together. But, uh, you know, keep your commits up. Um, what's my KPI? I, I, I'm, uh, I, when I heard a great quote in one of your former podcasts, uh, pipeline is lifeline, you know, so I like to see a 3x pipeline, you know, I'll, I'll go down to a 2x if the fellow demonstrates that he's, that he's pretty good at forecasting, uh, if they're not, then I make him get up to 4 or 5x, but uh, no, I, I always look for sort of a roughly a 3x pipeline full, pipeline is lifeline. Pipeline is lifeline. I do also like the simplicity of the way you guys forecast, you have commit and you have pull in. And that's it. And so you're right. Forecasting exercise can be done in 10, 15 minutes if you can simplify it down, yeah. especially when you have sales managers already we, working. We have the stages. We, we've got qualification and prospect and, 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 and things. But, but uh, again, you worry too much about the early stuff on. Oh, it froze up sure. on me, Tom. Sure. Um, oh, there you go. Awesome. Okay. So now we're on to the final question. Who in your sales ops career has inspired or educated you the most? Well, that was a good question. I love it when you asked this question. I, I wanted to meet everybody that anybody ever mentioned. Uh, for me, one of my heroes is, is a gentleman named Mark Stewart. Mark's with a company called Neural Impact. And uh, with so much constant change in IT over 40 years, uh, you know, the one constant is human. So uh, Mark is a big about the, the psychology of sales. Why do people buy? Getting to that why understanding. We, you know, in, in, in the present context, I, I say to salespeople, you know, nobody wakes up in the morning and yawns and says, I think I'm going to buy a construction documentation system today. You know, there's always a psychological reason. Something drives it. So, you know, I'm training my salespeople to ask, you know, what's prompted you? 
you know, too. So Mark is is uh, is a big proponent. Mark's to it at, at Neural. Um, another gentleman, Enzo DeMichael, was the former VP of Sales for uh, Sage Software. Again, another you know common sense. Uh, what can I do to help? Uh, learning animal, you know, I, I, I learned as much from him as as, 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 I, as I could. Uh, again, I haven't met her yet, but uh, Kim Brown, I would like to have lunch with Kim Brown as well because she was uh, had, a, had a great attitude. She's what she called herself a, a salesperson described as a marketer, or disguised as a marketer, or a marketer disguised as a salesperson. Those two are, are it's the line is blurred now. There's no sales versus marketing anymore. It's so tightly connected. Well, I hope Kim is listening, and we can help set up that lunch for you, Patrick. Um, I'm sure she, sure, would, she yeah. would be pleased. Um, <laughs> amazing. So I'm actually going to, there's one thing that I want to pull out, which is pretty unique, I think, to this episode and also to these times. And it's the, the, the kind of double-edged sword of engaging with existing customers or even potential customers to give advice, to give information that you found, um, to act as a trusted advisor. So when everything returns to, to more normal, you're, they're going to come to you first. Yeah. But then also, as you're doing that, treating that as, <laughs> as a research call so you can get more information to facilitate that loop. And I think that is a really, really good way to, as you said, keep sales reps busy if uh, deals are not being done during this time. Yeah, the goal is always, if you, if you bring value to each call, they'll take your call. You know, and that's what every salesperson wants. I mean, you know, again, psychologically speaking, salespeople are certainly coin operated. People always think that. Uh, you know, but at the same time, you know, most of the good salespeople I've known over the years have a desire, obviously, to make money. But it's, their biggest desire was to be relevant to their customers. You know what I mean? To 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 bring value. So any time that Pat calls, you know, I'm going to learn something. Or he's going to share. He's got my best interest in heart. So I challenge salespeople to say, you know, like, what's what's in it for the customer when you're calling. You know, and that's why we. We heard the uh, the saying, listening to radio station WIIFM. You heard that that saying in sales? You have to, when you're talking to someone, you have to say, you see the letters WIIFM. They're always listening to what's in it for me. You know, so yeah. it's, uh, you always keep that in mind. You know, the customer's always listening to radio station WIIFM. And so you you, you wrap your your, um, your value around that, right? And that's why these sharing educational insights and best practices is a, is a real easy way to do that. Awesome. Patrick, we'll finish on that. Thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure, Tom. I'll look forward to the next shows. I listen to them almost on a daily basis, and I always learn something. So I think that's the other key element is be a learning animal. So thank you very much. I appreciate you having me on the show. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sales of Demystified podcast. If you are listening on a podcast listening application, then please subscribe, rate, and review. And if you have any questions about the show, if you know a guest, or if you have any questions about sales operations, just hit me up at tomhunt at ebster.com. That's tomhunt at ebster.com.